Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, 1 minute 30 seconds LOS, all systems go, over. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. Humanity was never meant to leave Earth. Evolution, our biology, and the laws of nature have long enforced the notion that we are destined for this floating rock and nothing more. Yet, humanity has never stopped dreaming of the stars, of going above and beyond. Not just literally, but in every facet of our reality. Mankind's first landing on the moon was a dream come true for many, but what if it was only the beginning? What if, ever since then, generations of dreamers have been inspired to reach the stars like never before? For over half a century, humanity has achieved excellence, evoked wonder, and ignited a universal spark of greatness. Never without folly, division, or resistance, but always with the aspiration to be better. All the while, the stars have been our muse, especially in the science fiction genre of literature, film, and media, the canvas for our culture's future hopes and fears. That however far any dream has seemed, the imagination of artists, writers, and dreamers have recaptured a fleeting glimpse of the impossible. It's by no coincidence that some of the greatest innovators in art and media over the last few decades were also pioneers of science fiction. George Lucas, Ridley Scott, Sid Mead, George Orwell, Ursula Le Guin, and Frank Herbert. These names, and the works associated with them, are legendary. But even they never dreamed of creating the types of worlds that would be at the cultural heart of the 21st century. Worlds that are interactive. The gaming medium is still evolving, and with it, the potential to impact a new generation of dreamers in entirely new ways. The plight of Joel and Ellie in The Last of Us, the plunge through darkness and despair fraught in Dark Souls, and the breathtaking freedom of Breath of the Wild all prove that it's no longer just about playing a game, but having an experience. And arguably, there has never been a greater testament to that than the video game trilogy that redefined the power of interactive storytelling forever. A sci-fi odyssey of unprecedented ambition, born from the dreams of a team of young game developers out of Edmonton, Canada. This is the legend of Mass Effect. By 2007, Bioware's name was already synonymous with greatness. Between Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Neverwinter Nights, Jed Empire, and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, Bioware was widely revered as a heavyweight in the role-playing game genre. However, their greatest games had always been built in the worlds of other creators, a fact Bioware became well aware of over the years. Aside from Shattered Steel, the mech combat game that launched the company in 1996, Bioware's first attempt to build a new IP, 2005's Jade Empire, failed to meet sales expectations and a sequel never fully materialized. At the same time, Bioware was still stuck in the small studio mentality of their early days, where devs worked exhaustively long hours to ship a game. Having moved to their largest office yet in 2004 after the smash success of KOTOR, the studio needed to change their ways if they were to properly oversee larger projects. Though the future weighed heavily on Bioware, it was no less equipped with the right people to face that future head on. James Olin, Mark Dara, Lou Christensen, Drew Karpishin, David Gator, Matt Goldman, Aaron Flynn, and Derek Watts. All legends in their own right, but far from being the industry all-stars they're known as today. Eventually, the company became bold. Eager to finally create universes of their own, the future of Bioware was split between two different projects. One was a fantasy RPG helmed by Olin and Gator, known as Dragon Age Origins. 
the other, was born in the wake of KOTOR's launch from the mind of its project director. A mechanical engineering grad and aspiring fighter pilot who started at Bioware as a 3D artist on Neverwinter Nights, Casey Hudson. His idea was codenamed SFX. What if Bioware took the team behind the award-winning Knights of the Old Republic and set them loose on a sci-fi universe entirely of their own design? That was the basis of Hudson's pitch to Bioware presidents Ray Muzika and Greg Zeshuk for SFX, a setting that demanded memorable companions, futuristic worlds, mature sci-fi themes, and a character-driven story. I'm in charge here, Garrus, not you! Nothing Bioware hadn't pulled off in the past, but never at the scale Hudson dreamed of. It would take the studio an entire year just to fully flesh out the vision. While the conceptual blueprint for the world of SFX was fueled by Star Wars, Star Trek, Blade Runner, and beloved 80s sci-fi, Bioware's approach to gameplay was inspired by Deus Ex's blend of action and player freedom, Halo's futuristic warfare, and Starlight's space exploration. And as with previous Bioware titles, SFX would place a big emphasis on player choice, but with a very unique twist. SFX would be told as a trilogy, where the player's choices rippled across all three games. And even the idea of saying that you're going to do a trilogy, you have to, you have to plan that you're going to do that. But to be able to, to do that and know that it's going to have to span recessions, it's going to have to span changes in the industry and the way people consume games, the way people play them. The idea that you create a character and then these choices and these relationships actually span huge game titles, that's something that's never been done before and I would argue might never be done again. From its very inception, Bioware's ambitions for SFX were positively staggering. A grand experiment that, if successful, might not only result in three of Bioware's best games, but one of the most groundbreaking game series ever put together. But to succeed as a trilogy, SFX needed to have the right framework right from the beginning. Much of the game's four-year development was spent building tools and systems for Unreal Engine 3 to last the whole trilogy, including more expressive facial rigging and motion capture tech. While cast and voice director Chris Borders assembled Bioware's most formidable cast to date, with the esteemed likes of Seth Green, Keith David, Lance Henriksen, Ali Hillis, Kimberly Brooks, and Fred Tajashore, Drew Karbashin led the writer's room in weaving their respective corners of the SFX universe into a coherent, flexible narrative. Derek Watts and Matt Rhodes would visualize worlds, alien ships, and technology to fuel the team's vision. And, after scoring Jade Empire, Jack Wall came on to create the music of SFX, a modern take on Blade Runner, Tangerine Dream, and the iconic electronic movement of the 80s. Along the way, Wall was joined by Sam Hulick, who famously wrote the iconic Uncharted Worlds theme when he originally auditioned for composer, and Richard Jakes and David Gates for cutscenes in just the final weeks of scoring. After years of iteration, experimentation, and raising the bar far past any previous Bioware effort, the final pieces of Hudson's sci-fi passion project united as one. A game that would infamously be known as... Right from the first frames of the game's iconic opening, Bioware hoists you over the shoulder of Commander Shepard, marching triumphant to the front line of a daring new space age as humanity's newest hero. Your hero. This is Mass Effect, a story-driven action RPG with real-time third-person shooter combats, meaningful choices, and dizzying spectacle. In many ways, its design was uncanny for 2007. It had classes, but not stats. The dialogue wheel reflected the tone of its dialogue, but not what Shepard would say verbatim. And though you commanded a party of squad mates, you could never play as them. Because Mass Effect was not trying to be an RPG, it was trying to make you Commander Shepard. Contrary to many RPGs of the time, the choice-driven gameplay of Mass Effect allowed the player to exert influence over a heavily authored character. Not one you create, but one with a pre-established background, personality, and goals. Of course, almost no CRPG has ever given players the exact freedom of a tabletop RPG, and for good reason, but they've always strived to emulate as much of it as possible. Not with Shepard, not quite anyway. Instead, Bioware wanted to take its players on a very specific journey, but not at the complete expense of their agency. The compromise was wiggle room, like with Shepard's gender, their background, and their choices in dialogue. 
Shepard is still a commander of the Alliance Navy, but we have a say in what kind of commander. Right out the gate, in fact. That's enough. Your soldiers, act like it. Initially, the downside is that the player's limited choices make no difference. Whether you insult Joker or praise his flying, the outcome of this conversation is always the same. This certainly doesn't apply to every choice in Mass Effect, but enough of them to suggest that most of what the player chooses is inconsequential. This is the truth, and up to 2007, it's a problem no game of similar design was able to solve. Not until Mass Effect. How do you make the player believe in the impact of their choices without changing Shepard? You need to pull a magic trick. And what better way to do that than by borrowing from the medium of movie magic? For the cinematic treatment of Mass Effect isn't just an aesthetic, it's one of the most important design decisions ever made in the RPG genre. By fusing the quick cuts, blocking, multiple camera angles, lens flares, film grain, and high production value of the cinematic medium with the RPG, Bioware sweeps us into their fantasy and inspires us to believe in the illusion of choice. That every reaction, line of dialogue, and mission outcome serves a greater purpose in the overarching story. The dialogue wheel is less about choosing what Shepard says, and more about directing them on how to say it. We are both the actor and the director, the player and the storyteller. A brilliant dichotomy, and it was all an experiment. To tell this story, we need to know what it's about. And to be Commander Shepard, we'll need the right actor. Enter Jennifer Hale and Mark Muir, two halves of the same Shepard. I, I should go. go. Because Shepard was Bioware's first fully voiced RPG protagonist, Hudson and Borders wanted Hale and Muir to deliver a neutral performance that allowed the players to project any background they had for Shepard's responses. And, well, that's exactly what they did. As the decorated voice actors behind Bastilla Shan, Naomi Hunter, Mazzy Fenton, and Number 86, Jennifer Hale had no trouble filling the boots of Commander Shepard. Mark Muir, on the other hand, who was originally only the stand-in for Shepard, is a goddamn treasure. Critics were never wrong to call Muir's performance flat. It is a bit underwhelming at times. But if you ask me, his blunt delivery leads to some of Mass Effect's most unintentionally hilarious and memorable moments. Say goodnight, Manuel. You cannot silence the truth. My voice must be heard. Oh my god! What did you do? That might have been a little extreme, Commander. Hudson and Borders would get a better grip on Shepard's voice in the sequel, but for the first game, it does the job. Then there's the storytelling. Though there is a lot to digest in Mass Effect's first few minutes, everything that truly matters has already been carefully laid out for the player. We're greeted first with the familiar. Joker's wooden wisecracking, Presley's prestige, Jenkins's trigger-ready soldiering, and Keith fucking David, all laced with the same underlying flair of humanity we know and love. Then we pass beyond the veil, and slowly into the weird. Nihilus and the avian-like Turians, the colony of Eden Prime, and the Mechalian army that bleeds its skies. Though this progression serves the player's exposure to the world, it also shows us our stake in it. Despite technological innovation and interstellar colonization, humanity is not at the forefront of its galactic revolution. In fact, we're several rungs down the ladder, playing second fiddle to the Overwatch of the Galactic Council. Nihilus is our introduction to that, a specter operating above the law to protect those who live beneath it, supposedly. This power struggle raises a lot of questions, and exactly the kind Bioware wants the player to ask. How will we prove ourselves to the Council? Will we vie for control, eradicate those in our path, or take the routes of diplomacy? And more importantly, what would we do with their approval, with Nihilus's kind of power? The answers won't just define Shepard, it will define the people for whom Mass Effect is all about. Because Mass Effect is a story about humanity, what it has to offer the galaxy, and what it will do in the face of adversity. Of course, for Shepard to stand out, we'll need an opportunity of extraordinary proportions. Something that will grab the undivided attention of human and Turian alike. We are under attack, taking heavy casualties. I repeat, heavy casualties. We can't get evac. They came out of nowhere. We need. Cuts out after that. No comm traffic at all. It just goes dead. There's nothing. Reverse and hold the 38.5. No music, 
no expression, just cold silence and awe. The drama magnetically shifts from backroom politics to a once in 50 millenniums threat. This mission just got a lot more complicated. A small strike team can move quickly without drawing attention. It's our best chance to secure the beacon. Grab your gear and meet us in the cargo hold. We are approaching drop point two. The surface of Eden Prime may be nothing to scoff at in 2183, especially after running past the same pile of crates a hundred times over, but the impression this place leaves on the player is still unshakable. In all three Mass Effect games, no single planet is quite as red as Eden Prime. That red lighting plants the seed of a recurring motif, the first glimmer of a sunset that will end all life in the galaxy, breeding death and destruction over every horizon. Between Husk's frightened survivors and Jenkins Leroying himself in just the first few minutes of gameplay, Mass Effect's turn into the eerie happens startlingly quick. While we navigate the ruin with our squad mates, Nihilus moves alone. He's not here for the humans, he's here on a mission. Unfortunately, so is Saren. As Nihilus lets his guard down, Sam Hulick distorts Shepard's heroic theme in the minor key. Suddenly, we have our villain. Complicated no longer scratches the surface. A flurry of action follows all the way to the Prothean Beacon. An ancient alien relic has never looked and been placed so ordinarily, but that's not the point. The beacon carries a desperate message, one that could not be read, but felt in agonizing detail. Shepard! No, don't touch it's too Dr. Chakwas. I think she's waking up. I saw... I'm not sure what I saw. A death, destruction, nothing's really clear. In just under an hour, we've had a taste of the world, the combat, Bioware's unique take on the RPG genre, and the conflict ahead. But like Shepard's vision, the finer details are hard to discern. We need more. Where Bioware takes us next will blow this galaxy wide open. One of my favorite locations in all of sci-fi. Look at the size of that ship. The Ascension, flagship of the Citadel fleet. Well, size isn't everything. Why so touchy, Joker? I'm just saying you need firepower too. The Jewel of the Stars. The Citadel is where the brightest corners of the Mass Effect universe gloriously collide, where the imagination of Sid Mead, John Harris, and Santiago Calatrava combine with Derek Watts' own aesthetics for the series. Swooping arches cutting across vertical lines, the defining design element of Mass Effect, evident on armor, weapons, and ships, but most prominently, the Citadel. Jack Wall's blend of synths and flutes evoke both utopic awe and intrigue, the perfect invitation to delve into the Citadel's hidden depths. Around one corner is the Stanford Taurus, but around another is a New York metropolis. Below the Presidium, within the wards, you get a hint of Bioware's brilliant layering of terrace from KOTOR, and all the while, you'll never stop wondering how big this thing actually is, and how small you must be compared to it. It's perhaps one of the greatest hubs in video game history, and Bioware's ability to both reinvent and redefine its importance with each new Mass Effect game is only proof of that. There must be millions here. It can't be possible to track everyone coming and going. The Citadel surely gleams on its surface, which is all the more amazing, considering deep down, it's secretly kind of dull. The Citadel that is explorable to the player is a mercifully thin vertical slice of what it's been propped up as. It's disjointed, awkward to navigate, and bereft of the bustling civilization that supposedly lives here. And yet, that's not the takeaway. Lest we forget, Bioware are really good magicians. Like our first trip aboard the Normandy, arriving at the Citadel has been specially curated for the player. Our meeting with Anderson, Udina, and the Council further grounds us in the Mass Effect universe, introducing us to the Asari and the Salarians. Just across the hall from the Human Embassy, where most players will naturally find themselves after the Council meeting, are the Volus and the Elcor, two of the weirder aliens in Mass Effect 1. Chastising remark. Don't be so rude, Dan. 
From here, the player will wander about the Presidium into more humans, but also more Volus, Asari, Salarians, Turians, and maybe a Hanar. Because it's a big, stupid jellyfish. This is the Mos Eisley Cantina, but with level design. Just when we've started to get a grip on the world established before Eden Prime, that world quickly expands well beyond our reach. We can spend hours chasing down quests, butting heads with alien races, and learning the mechanics of this world. Though we'll come to attach significance to every character-laden corner of the Citadel, the depth posited by our time here will leave us with the impression that we've only scratched the surface of Bioware's galaxy. Or alternatively, we can focus exclusively on the main path and still arrive at the same conclusion, because we never took the time to touch the Citadel's edges. The more important takeaway, however, might be who we literally take with us after the Citadel. To root out a small sliver of the Citadel's corrupt underbelly, we'll cross the paths of three particular aliens, all with storied lives of their own. Meet Gareth Vicarian, Rex Erdnott, and Tali Zora Naraya, the Normandy's newest recruits and Shepard's companions for the journey ahead. Like most things in Mass Effect, companions are more than meet the eye. Garrus, Rex, and Tally are useful combat allies with intriguing backstories, but they offer something far more valuable to Shepard in an increasingly alien galaxy. Perspective. On first encounter, each of these characters stand out, in some way. Rex and Tally are the first Krogan and Corian we come across, and Garrus feels like the first Turian with a shred of intuition. But after getting to know them, they become our personal connection to the races of the galaxy, and offer a telling reflection of Shepard themselves. Fed up with the Council's bureaucracy and protocols of CSEC, Garrus is something of a deviant from his duty-bound people. He will pursue the greatest good regardless of what it takes or who's in the way, even a fellow Turian. Despite his profession, there's nothing that matters more to the Krogan mercenary Rex than helping his people. The fallout of the Rachni War and Genophage unjustly set Krogan kind back in the galaxy. And unlike the Krogans under Saren's control, he refuses to let another Krogan be looked upon as a mindless weapon. Tally, quite simply, is at odds with an unwelcoming galaxy as she looks to bring something of value back to her people during her pilgrimage. Not to mention, her radiant charm is a fitting juxtaposition from the Corian created Geth. Together, these characters not only dispel many of the stereotypes fed to us by the embittered populace of the Citadel, but make a compelling argument that there's more that unites human and alien kind than divides them. Which makes it all the more interesting that you can outright reject your companion's insight. In fact, you can choose not to recruit Garrus or Rex altogether, and go through the whole game without them. Your loss. If you change your mind, come look me up. To Shepard, humankind may as well be on its own in the hunt against Saren, and will gain next to nothing of value from the alien races of the Milky Way. Or worse, the touted stereotypes about these aliens are absolutely true, that they can't be trusted in the slightest. Alternatively, Shepard might believe in the contrary that humans are only as important as the alien races they share a galaxy with, that hunting down Saren will take cooperation. Shepard is the ultimate judge, but they're nothing without their jury. Captain Anderson, who has long fought a losing battle to elevate the status of humans in the Milky Way, and Caden Alenko, who overcame a difficult past training under the militant Turing commander Vernus to hone cutting-edge biotic abilities. It was Vernus who made me see how human aliens are. They're not different or special. They're jerks and saints, just like us. On the other side of the aisle is Ambassador Udina, a beleaguered bureaucrat who insists purely on playing along with the Council's politics to gain human favor, and Ashley Williams, who holds deep-seated values in Christian and American beliefs, human excellence, and her family history of proud military service, especially against the Turians in the First Contact War. We, humanity, I mean, have to learn to rely on ourselves. This is the burden of being Commander Shepard. To not only be a hero for each diverse corner of humanity, but a hero for all walks of life. That may sound like an impossible task, and one that's not worth pursuing, especially after uncovering the deep division in communication, culture, and values between and within all the different races. But spend enough time here, ask enough questions, and reach out empathetically, you may find out what's already true of your crew. These people have more in common than they're willing to admit, right down to their design. Volus and Corians both wear Enviro suits. Turians, Corians, Salarians, and Krogans have backbowed legs. Elcor and Hanar speak in third person, and Asari and humans share many human like qualities. Though these similarities likely derive from the generation spanning cycles of evolution from which all these species separately evolved, 
or more accurately, the human model rigging Bioware was forced to give most of these races, it's a visual way of Bioware encouraging the player to think of all races as more alike than different. Likewise, the reason Shepard is mankind's candidate is built into the history of their name. Alan Shepard, the first American in space. The reason that Alan Shepard was the first American in space is because he was voted to be the first by his, his peers. That's how they, they chose. Um, and, you know, it was, out of, it was out of respect. He wasn't necessarily the most popular of them, but he was the one that they chose amongst themselves to go forward. And so there's a lot of great stuff about that. And, and then it has this, the second meaning, which is he's, he's the first human specter. And there is a shepherding of humanity quality to that. Unity is possible but not without relinquishing our pervasive superiority, defensiveness, and ego, a cornerstone of the human condition. And although we have failed to surrender that ego time and time again in human history, from one squabble, to one slaughter, to one war, to the next, the next, and beyond, Shepard can make a different choice. One not tainted by the vices of humanity or the folly of division rampant across the galaxy, but the aspiration to be better, to do the unprecedented, to save everyone. All they need is the chance to do it, to be a Spectre, the first of humankind. Spectres are not trained, but chosen. Individuals forged in the fire of service and battle, those whose actions elevate them above the rank and file. Spectres are an ideal, a symbol, the embodiment of courage, determination, and self-reliance. They are the right hand of the Council, instruments of our will. Spectres bear a great burden. They are protectors of galactic peace, both our first and last line of defense. The safety of the galaxy is theirs to uphold. What will Shepard do with this kind of power? Will they vie for control, eradicate those in their path, or take the route of diplomacy? Whether as a paragon of virtue or renegade of destruction, the answers are now. This is Commander Shepard speaking. We have our orders. Find Saren before he finds the conduit. And I refuse to let anything get in the way of that mission. Come on! For too long, our species has stood apart from the others. Now it's time for us to step up and do our part for the rest of the galaxy. But we don't need their help. We can do this on our own. When we go into the Traverse, Saren's followers will be waiting for us. But we'll be ready for them, too. None of the other species has the guts, grit, or balls to deal with this. Humanity needs to do this. Not just for our own sake, but for the sake of every other species in Citadel space. We're the only ones who can stop Saren. I swear to you all, we will stop him. Everything in the second act of your Mass Effect journey escalates into the stratosphere. The freedom to explore, the scope and might of the planetscapes that surround you, the bursts of all-out gunfights, and the drama to unfold in the narrative. Altogether, Act 2 is nothing less than a chaotic fucking tapestry. A menagerie of moving, interlocking parts sewn together into something surprisingly smooth and coherent. And yet, every player will weave it differently. In traditional cinematic storytelling, we often think of one scene as the direct result of the scene before it. But in Mass Effect, where the film medium and RPG go hand in hand, those scenes can be rearranged and remixed with different choices, companions, and character builds while telling a slightly different, meaningful story each time. Even on the back end of this experience, the tech that accounts for player choice and ripples it across the game plays a vital role in elevating this fantasy. Traveling to the world of Novaria first may just be a matter of proximity, or going straight to Therum a matter of recruiting your last squad mate as soon as possible. But in the context of the greater story, Shepard might see recruiting Dr. Liar to Sony as a priority, as her insight about the Protheans will no doubt help N7 on Novaria, Pharos, and beyond. Or Shepard might prioritize staying on Saren's heels by going to Novaria, helping the people in dire need on Pharos, and then reviewing the data after the fact with Liara. Just be prepared for a most confusing introduction if so, as Liara will have been trapped in stasis for a very long time by then, missed out on the confrontation with her mother, and all the scientific revelations made along the way. I know how it works! I've studied it! Ugh. Calm down, Liara. 
Are you yelling at a figment of your imagination? On its surface, this chunk of the game lifts its structure directly from KOTOR, as with so much else of Mass Effect. But take a wide step back and peer at the full majesty of this quilt, one will grasp Bioware's sheer ambition to create the most engaging gameplay loop they've ever assembled. From a distance, it works impressively well, yielding to the player's freedom and direction, but look deep between the threads and you'll find a whole galaxy of issues. Of course, there's some discrepancies to the route the player might take, and frankly it's impossible for a narrative this complex not to. Bioware has already achieved wonders with a modest budget and some clever magic tricks. There's no reason to believe they won't do it again. At least, until you venture deep into the Milky Way, within the uncharted pockets of space. These worlds may feign to conceal secrets beyond the player's imagination, but their mystery is nothing more than an illusion that fades on first contact. Welcome to the Mako, the true antagonist of Mass Effect 1. This gravity-defying hunk of metal and duct tape is your sole mode of transportation across uncharted worlds, one of Bioware's key selling points for Mass Effect on its release. Though they capture the alluring glint of roaming the galactic frontier, nearly every world is barren and lifeless, devoid of the same wonder, world-building, and storytelling promised by everything we've experienced up to this point. Don't get me wrong, I like exploring these worlds. They oddly capture shades of a space western, as you hunt down rogue scientists, fringe cults, and AWOL soldiers like some sort of galactic bounty hunter. But if you are the director of this experience, the uncharted worlds represent what could have been left on the cutting room floor, which in the case of Mass Effect, happens to be a lot. The volcanic world of Therum, where we're introduced to Liara, is a gauntlet in more ways than one. We rover through checkpoints on the Mako, battle a legion of Geth, and rescue Sleeping Beauty. Though instead of a castle, she's trapped deep underground. Shepard may be charming, but Therum certainly isn't. Bioware's plans for Therum were far more involved in its early development, with a sprawling underground base built around the caldera of a volcano and a raging battle between a mining colony and the Geth. In the final game, it's a repurposed E3 demo, fraught with some of the most imbalanced common encounters in the whole series. It plays far better in the Legendary Edition, but back in 2007, Mass Effect's combat had a lot of problems, and Therum's non-stop engagements forced the player to deal with those problems. Between cumbersome UI, input delay, biotic spam, and stupefyingly fast enemies that kill in one hit, any doubts that this was Bioware's first fully-fledged real-time combat system flew out the airlock after leaving Therum. Gearing and mods do help your survival somewhat, but only if you're willing to scroll through the endless pools of items you invariably get after every mission. And even then, the difference in stats from that gear can often feel negligible. Casey Hudson and his team knew that creating this universe would be an ambitious task from the start, especially in a medium built from nothing but code. And so far swept up in this experience, they've done a damn good job at making you forget that. Even with their modest budget, the deadlines of a four-year development cycle, the tools of Unreal Engine 3, and the harrowing trial and error of game development. But to ensure this trilogy's liftoff, Bioware needed to reach for the stars. When each one is an unfinished wasteland, Mass Effect feels no different from the rank and file. The gaming industry's one-off IPs, overly ambitious titles, and failed experiments. But perhaps I'm being too harsh on Mass Effect. After all. Not every planet is a forgettable wasteland. Certainly not Novaria. Approach control, this is the SSV Normandy, requesting a vector and a berth. Normandy, your arrival was not scheduled. Our defense grid is armed and tracking you. State your business. Citadel business. We got a council specter aboard. Where the Citadel showed us a galactic civilization ensnared by the council's political web, Novaria exposes a corporate web. Under the iron fist of Novaria's development corporation, the seeming rulers of this frozen rock. Right from landfall, Shepard is forced to navigate Port Hanshan's stringent rules and regulations. That even in spite of our Spectre status, unfettered greed is the preeminent authority on Novaria. Every minute of my time you waste costs the company 12 credits. I will keep a running tally. As we devise an escape from Port Hanshan, we're given opportunities to enable that greed or expose it, to comply with the NDC's authority or antagonize it. Though Hanchan is particularly compact, the versatility of outcomes is positively bursting. By the time you leave the port, it's possible you'll have suspended Administrator Analyse's secretary for espionage or helped her expose her boss's corruption. You might have helped this Hanar secure a package of weapon mods or report him to Analyse for smuggling. 
Or, in my favorite combo, you might have helped the secretary, report her and the Hanar to the administrator while keeping his weapon mods, and then blackmail Analeas with the dirt you found earlier. Analeas, if I don't report in, the board will figure it out. Put the weapon- I said I'm not losing this job! No matter what state Hanshan's authorities are left in, the true rulers of Novaria are found at Peak 15, a prehistoric kingdom newly claimed by a long extinct threat. The maze of tubes and elevators that encompass Peak 15 are the stomping grounds for the Rachni, a race of sentient creatures that once waged war on the galaxy. With their resurfacing, Shepard is elected to preside over their fate, a power no human has held before meeting the greater galaxy 26 years earlier. The soldiers, scientists, and benefactors scattered about the base may inform that responsibility, but not as much as Liara, who has been forced to watch her mother succumb to indoctrination. My people have an expression too. Only a child never contradicts her mother. The Rachni Queen is a matriarch in a different sense, and one who recognizes the threat of her presence. Venezia may have had no choice in her actions, but the Queen does. Of course, excluding Liara from this mission alike excludes that perspective, but ambiguity is still built into the dilemma. We can give the Rachni Queen a second chance to set a new legacy for her people, or return them promptly to extinction. Your decisions on Novaria will no doubt elicit input from the Council and among the crew. The Council is one thing. Are you calling in a report just so you can cut us off again? You know it. But your crew is another. One of the never-ending delights of the Mass Effect series is the Bioware tradition of talking to your crew after every mission. Not just for their appraisal, but also to grow closer with them. These conversations inform your understanding of the world, and may even influence Shepard's identity, but what you may not realize is that your choices alike impact your companion's identity. Just as Shepard falls along the Paragon Renegade spectrum, so do all of your companions. Caden may start out as Paragon, but may eventually be led down Renegade by a Renegade Shepard. Or Garrus may feel torn between the Paragon Protocols of CSEC and the Renegade tendencies of Shepard's command, but how you handle the fate of Dr. Salian will decide where he truly stands. Never hesitate when you've got the enemy in your sights, Garrus. Point taken. The example that Shepard sets matters, and it will come back to you. The Rachni Queen was one of many decisions in Mass Effect where your companions weigh in, offering the most Paragon perspective. They made a mistake. They let the Krogan go too far. This is a chance for us to atone. And the most renegade one. Commander, I don't trust this thing. We know its kind are killers. Though the mechanical framework of game design may give this influence the feeling of brainwashing, there's really no mistaking that your companions are people entirely of their own, exercising free will, but ultimately inspired to follow Shepard's lead which is quite the contrary to Zoo's hope. The towering skyscrapers and endless bridges across Pharos offer players the sights and sounds of an epic sci-fi battlefield, as the survivors of Zoo's hope colony ward off a Geth invasion. The real conflict, however, is nestled out of sight, deep below ground, where the Thorian, a mind-melding monstrosity, controls Zoo's hope. This is Exogeny's well-guarded secret, until Shepard discovers they're the ones who unleashed the Thorian on the colony to study its effects. This is a human colony, Jong. You can't just repurpose us. It's not just you. There's something here far more valuable than a few colonists. Once again, Shepard must make the choice no one else can, condemning Exogeny's unchecked corpocracy or letting them off the hook, preserving the lives of the colonists or severing them like a tumor. And finally, enduring the cruelest boss fight in the game, and restoring agency to the people. Though the web of decisions offered to Shepard on Novaria, Pharos, and beyond have been intricate and, at times, impactful, they weren't particularly difficult decisions. Paragon sides with apparent justice, while Renegade delights in unsolicited chaos. I've had enough of your snide insinuations. Other than for the sake of tailoring the direction of your Mass Effect journey, there's rarely been a compelling perspective to the Renegade option. 
Between ancient threats, corporate overlords, and all manner of unknown out in the Milky Way, the galaxy needs a hero, and 92% of Mass Effect 1 players happened to agree with that. The Renegade approach is certainly far more popular among this Milky Way's inhabitants, and still gets the job done, but in the most ignoble way possible. At the same time, no threat has completely stumped Shepard. They've yet to meet their match, or brush with failure. So just when it feels like we're unstoppable, Vermeer changes everything. Welcome to Paradise. From the initial Mako Blitz to the winding causeways of Saren's base, Bioware takes the player on an inviting tour through the tropical world of Vermeer. But Shepard is no tourist on vacation, they're a marine, and Vermeer is a trial of combat, of leadership, and by fire. This tropical backdrop invokes something of the Asian Pacific battlegrounds of World War II, where life and death fed into a plentiful cycle. Make no mistake here, death is coming. And if you're not careful, that could start with Rex. If you can't give me a better reason than this to destroy the hopes of my people, then I'm done with you. A Krogan army under Saren's control would wreak havoc on the galaxy. That's not up for debate, but Rex's loyalty is. We could dissociate from the fate of the Rachni Queen, regardless of what our choice was, but we can't easily dissociate from one of our own. In fact, our personal connection to him makes this encounter far more difficult. If the tables were turned, would we retaliate in the same way? Without making every previous decision in Rex's favor, only a player high on charm or intimidate can dissuade Rex from insubordination. Otherwise, Rex is faced with a bitter possibility. You can't save everyone. Whether you sacrifice Rex or regain his loyalty, the odds of emerging ahead of Saren unscathed are next to nil. Our influence stopped the Rachni, but before that, we held the line. Our influence stopped the Krogan, but before that, we held the line. Our influence will stop Saren. In the battle today, we will hold the line. Your tactical decisions play out in real time during the assault on Saren's base, as the lives of Kirhi's men depend on Shepard's actions. Impregnable as the Nautical Fortress is, it can't stop Commander Shepard. Up to now, nothing in this journey really has. Until today. All the action in the world comes to a chilling standstill as we enter the chamber of an unfathomable power. There is a realm of existence so far beyond your own, you cannot even imagine it. I am beyond your comprehension. I am sovereign. In an ever-expanding galaxy, sovereign conveys the truly unreachable, unimaginable, and unknowing. It's all pretty damn vague, written well before Bioware probably fleshed out the Reapers, but that's why it captivates. At the core of the Reapers is H.P. Lovecraft, a man who obsessed over cosmic entities, mankind's insignificance in the universe, and fear of the unknown. We can already see flourishes of cosmic Lovecraftian threats in the Rachni and the Thorian, but not to the extent of Sovereign. Their dialogue may as well have been lifted directly from Lovecraft's essay on supernatural horror and literature, while their squid-like design was likely a direct inspiration of Cthulhu. But most of all, Sovereign embodies the complete antithesis to every hope we've held about the Milky Way thus far. That humans can't possibly hope to grasp the universe that surrounds them, they serve no ultimate purpose in it, and that every scientific innovation that has led humanity to the final frontier will be our very undoing. Shepard can reduce their threats to the musings of a machine all they want, but lingering on in the back of our minds long after this encounter is Sovereign's deadly truth. The Protheans tried to fight, and they were utterly destroyed. Trillions dead, but what if they had bowed before the invaders? Would the Protheans still exist? Is submission not preferable to extinction? Saren is not the villain we've been led to believe. Instead, he's the victim of Sovereign's indoctrination, the tragic protagonist of a Lovecraftian tale, who succumbs to the futility of resistance and gives in to fear. He's not beyond reason, but he is painfully out of depth. We can't save Saren, we could barely save Rex, and worst of all, we can't save both Ashley and Caden. 
This is the crushing blow of Mass Effect 1. That no matter how hard we fought for human colonies, warded off alien threats, and made strides for humanity, our mission to save the galaxy eventually forces us to sacrifice one of humanity's greatest warriors. You may think Caden is a piece of cardboard, or Ashley an irredeemable xenophobe. Many players have, but you'll never have the chance to prove otherwise after this mission. Once you make your choice, that character is gone from the rest of the trilogy. Human blood will be on Shepard's conscience, and won't soon be washed away. At the very least, we had a choice, and that's maybe more than Sarah could say of his own soul. Alright everybody, hang on! Mass Effect was never the same after Vermeer. That despite what aspects of Bioware's vision collapsed technically or narratively, it all came together in one lethal blow to Shepard. Our choices had consequences, and we've endured a crippling setback. How can Shepard be a hero for all walks of life if they can't even be a hero for humanity? The answer better come soon. Because doom is on the horizon, and it's never been more clear. There are serious political implications here, Shepard. Humanities make great gains thanks to you, but now you're becoming more trouble than you're worth. After everything Shepard did to prove their worth to the Council, to prove humanity's worth to the Council, their efforts are still ignored. Sovereign's threats may loom, but they can never rival the unfettered ego of the Council. Their faux notions of the galaxy only validate Sovereign's jests of superiority, and jeopardize the lives of untold trillions across the Milky Way. Just like Anderson years before, Shepard and his crew are sent to the back of the line, where humanity has always been. Maybe Saren was right. Not that submission was preferable to extinction, but that we will fight a battle even if we know we cannot win it. So while we may have failed to convince the Council, Shepard isn't ready to stop fighting for the galaxy. For if Shepard never tries, all of their ambition will have been for nothing. More than ever, it becomes apparent what humanity needs to do to earn their place in the galaxy. Not waiting its turn through the chain of command, but by doing something drastic. Taking the reins by force. <laughs> Humanity is back in the fight, and our latest battleground is Ilos, the tangled ruin of an eternally damned civilization, imbued with the gold hue of a lost city like El Dorado. Traces of the Prothean civilization that once walked Ilos still linger on in the ruin, but far too little to salvage, just as it was on Eden Prime, Therum, and Pharos. In the face of impending Reaper invasion, the mystery of the Protheans may never be solved. But upon entering the Prothean Archives, a different impression sets in. Something indescribable. I have spent my life studying the Protheans, but I never dreamed I would discover anything like this. Stasis pods climb an untouchable ceiling, as shafts of light illuminate a never-ending plunge past lost tomes and ancient secrets. All the while, Jack Wall's haunting score captures the mesmerizing legacy of the long-dead Protheans. We tread the halls of dead gods. But unlike the Rachni, the Thorian, or even Sovereign, nothing in Mass Effect, nothing in the gaming medium will ever bring us closer to grips with the true fragility of our own human existence than this moment. My name is Vigil. You are safe here for the moment, but that is likely to change. Soon, nowhere will be safe. Why did you bring me here? You must break a cycle that has continued for millions of years. But to stop it, you must understand, or you will make the same mistakes we did. 
In all art and media I've ever experienced, I don't think anything has ever made me feel as small as the conversation with Vigil. That no matter what humans, or any race for that matter, may do to reject their mortality and live as if the universe orbits around them, the mere notion of being next in an exhaustively long line for inevitable extinction demands an emotion far beyond what we're capable of expressing. There are no cheap tricks to this moment, and no emotional spin. Just blunt truth. No offer of surrender was ever given. Our enemy had a single goal. The extinction of all advanced organic life. Over the course of Mass Effect, we've silently dealt with two sides of the galaxy. One that is organic, flawed, and mortal, and another that is synthetic, precise, and immortal. We've butt heads time and time again with Krogans, Solarians, Asari, and humans alike, only to find real solutions among the abandoned VI programs of bases and ruins. If Mass Effect has shown us anything, it's that people, whether blinded by pride, selfishness, or stupidity, kind of suck. Regardless of their motive, the Reapers speak to this cynicism. That machines can and will one day overpower mankind, a fear deeply rooted in the sci-fi genre and Lovecraft's thesis of human insignificance. We can dismantle each and every machine we like, but our tumultuous fuck-ups will one day lead us to our demise. However, in all of Vigil's deliberations about the end of organic life, there is a grain of optimism. The Protheans did alter the Keeper's signal, allowed the Keepers to evolve beyond the Reaper's uses to access the Citadel Relay, and gave the next cycle a chance they never had. Not because they were smarter than the Reapers, but because they did something no synthetic could ever conceive of. They made a choice. One that could have easily gone differently, had the Protheans devoted every last resource to their own preservation. Instead, the Protheans sacrificed the last of their kind to save trillions of lives they will never know and may never remember them either. Free will is the sole advantage organic life holds over the Reapers, the very same willpower you've exercised from the moment you chose your own shepherd. Bioware's approach to choice was never just about following the footsteps of the RPG genre, but by epitomizing the defining strength of all organic life. The Reapers and the Geth are the perfect antagonists because they are the antithesis to choice, right down to the Reapers' indoctrination. And whether Paragon or Renegade, our power to make a choice is Shepard's greatest victory and saving grace. So despite how many hopeless eons have passed before us, we can still choose to believe in hope, even if it means we'll lose. With the conduit open to the Citadel, we have to avenge the Protheans and stop Saren before a new cycle begins. And if there's any vehicle that can survive being hurtled a million light years across the galaxy, it's gotta be the Mako. It wouldn't be enough to battle through the familiar halls and walkways of the Citadel on red alert for our final mission. Bioware saves one of its coolest magic tricks for last, tilting the Citadel by 90 degrees. Or should I say, tilting the opening cutscene for the ease of entering this level. Mass Effect 1 comes full circle in its ending, as the red shroud of Sovereign looms over the Citadel as it did the skies of Eden Prime. We were too late to save the colonists, but it's not too late to save the galaxy. Shepard's final confrontation with Saren is a two-part battle. This will end with us filling his zombified husk with bullets, but the more important battle is one of reason to expose the dwindling spark of Saren's soul before it's devoured forever. Through our investment in either charm or intimidate, Shepard can coerce Saren's rebellion and inspire his willpower. Even if he'll lose, Saren chooses to fight. Saren was a victim, but also a lesson. 
He antagonized humans, abused his power, and trivialized the lives of others. And that was before Sovereign. Through and through, Saren was a renegade, and the Council's best operative for it. Now at the climax of the battle for the Citadel, Shepard can learn from Saren's example through one of three choices. Let the Council perish and take control of their power, save the Council and cultivate a future of diplomacy, or focus on eradicating Sovereign, no matter the cost. This is the moment humanity has worked to achieve, albeit not in such dire circumstances. Though the Council's ignorance led to this outcome, we'd be no better than Saren to trivialize their lives, especially if we want the allyship of the races they represent. Alternatively, who's to say the Alliance's sacrifice for the Council won't go unnoticed, or that their leadership will only push the galaxy closer to its demise? Each choice reflects multiple viewpoints, and says something different about Shepard. But whichever trade-off is made, Sovereign will stand no chance against the united forces of organic life. Guard on my flank! We're going in! When our Mass Effect journey first began, we had a mission. Not just to hunt down Saren, but to prove humanity had something of value to offer the galaxy. Whether through an all-human council, a multiracial council led by humans, or the council as we already know it with either Udina or Anderson as humanity's representative, the galaxy will know humanity like it never has before. It might know our sacrifice for the greater good, or our uncompromised commitment to change our capacity for compassion, or our proclivity to destroy. Yet, what truly makes humanity stand out from all life in the galaxy was told through our journey. No matter the threat, the setback, or how impossibly against humanity the odds have been, Shepard never gave up, even when we lost the urge to keep going. Now that the Reapers are at the Milky Way's doorstep, Shepard will dedicate themselves to an entirely new challenge uniting all organic life to defeat the Reapers. Our work will be more than cut out for us, and probably take a few games to accomplish. But as Shepard storms off the scene and into the future, two conclusions are certain. Humanity is determined. And so was Bioware. Through thick and thin of this jank-ass, rough-around-the-edges video game adventure, Bioware's ambition pulled through in the end, giving a generation of gamers a thrilling introduction unlike anything they'd played before. Not every one of Hudson's ideas made it to the finish line, and even some of the ones that did left a lot to be desired. The promise of vast space exploration, the awkward reconfiguration of RPG mechanics, and the limitations of budget and design. But thankfully, what Mass Effect did pull off is arguably what mattered the most. Gripping characters, eloquent storytelling, and cinematic escapism unrivaled by any sci-fi video game in its time. Wherever in the galaxy Mass Effect was destined to go next, the response was unanimous. Everyone wanted to see it. Mass Effect 1 may have been far from Bioware's best game, but it achieved something so much better. It was the rightful beginning to a trilogy that would change the gaming medium forever. Hey everyone, welcome! To the end of the video congratulations on getting here this was yet another long video we've been putting out a lot of those this year um i want to keep this short first off of course thank you so much for watching this video i know it was a bit of a wait to get it out um last few summer months have been kind of tricky and a little unanticipated um but 
here we are nonetheless. As you can expect, there will be a video on Mass Effect 2 and 3 at some point in the next few months. The wait for those videos probably won't be as long as the wait for this one was, um, but nevertheless, stay tuned for that. Hopefully as well, there'll be some other videos mixed in there that are not related to Mass Effect. Um, the goal basically is just to have a, a, a kind of a busy fall slash winter on the channel here. So guys, you're the best. I appreciate all your support. You can follow me on Twitter at Parks Harmon, Instagram at Parks Harmon, uh, Twitch at, you know, forward slash Sator. And uh, you can also join our Discord, Sator's Artorium. The link to that is in the description below, I believe. Um, but yeah, so that's all I got for now. Um, hope to see you all in the next video. Peace out, everybody. We'll bang, okay?